Praise God. Hallelujah. So good that everybody's just socializing. We're a social church. We love to communicate. We love to spend time with each other. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. September 1st. Oh my God. Where has the time gone already, right? We just wrapped up fun month, which was so awesome. As you could see all those pictures that we took, everyone took part of it. I just thank you for that. Everyone who helped me with the socials every week, I just appreciate you. I could not have done it without you. We we are a church that loves to do things and we're just a community and I'm just so thankful for my team. I'm I'm Norma, I'm one of the ministers here at Redemptive Grace, and um, I usually am in charge of feeding you. (laughs) And today, I am in charge, or I was led to give you spiritual food. We need physical food, but we also need spiritual food. So, if you don't know me, if you wanna join my team, please, Join my team, it's so much fun. I tell people it's not what you know, it's who you know. (laughs) So if you know the cafeteria person, then you're good. I could hook you up with an extra slice of whatever. (laughs) And when Pastor Wendy brings her delicious pudding and I have some leftover in the kitchen and you want extra, hey, it's not what you know, it's who you know. (laughs) So maybe that'll encourage you to join the team. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, (laughs) so again, we wrapped up Fun Month. That was awesome. I just want to thank all the pastors and the ministers leading up to this. Uh, You know, this this has been an awesome, awesome series, Uh, just a spiritual discipline of, of having a word life from Pastor Jeff. And Minister James' word of on practicing a petition, which we all need, right? Minister David on the heart of fasting, that was amazing. I think Minister David put an extra twist on it, you know, bringing his own experience about him not having food. You know, that, that's truly awesome and transparent and I appreciate his vulnerability. And Pastor Wendy, about her worship, having a heart of worship. We all have, I, I have a heart of worship. I love to worship. So that, that came easy for me, but not, it doesn't come easy for everyone. So I encourage you, if you've missed any of these spiritual disciplines, I encourage you to go back and check them out because they are truly God-given gifts that we need to develop in our lives. And so last but not least, I wanna thank the pastors, Pastor Mike and Pastor Pam, who once again, <laughs> given me this opportunity to bring the word today. And I'm so thankful for them for believing in me every single time when I don't even believe in myself. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, I told Gilbert, I said, Gilbert, I'm not going to sign up the next time. I'm not, you don't let me. And Pastor Mike came to me and he was, I said, yeah, I'll talk. And Gilbert goes, you told me, you told me not to. And I was like, it's God, I, I have to be obedient. And so if I'm not obedient, then I'm gonna miss something that's in store and I don't ever wanna do that. So I thank you, I thank you, I thank everyone. I thank Pastor Mike and Pastor Pam again. So now I'm gonna be talking about communion. And it was very difficult. I thought I knew what I knew and I really didn't know very much. And I'm so thankful for the time that God has given me to just really uh, understand what uh, communion is and what it means to us in the church and his people. So if I can get everyone to stand, I am going to read, we're gonna do a reading of the word. We're gonna be in Revelations 1, 1 through 6. If you can turn your Bibles, make sure you bring your Bibles. Please make sure you bring your Bibles. This is the bread. If everyone is there, can you say amen? Amen. All right. All right, Revelations 1. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant. The event that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is the report of the word of God and a testimony of Jesus Christ. 
God bless the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he is and he blesses all who listen to the message and obeys what it says, for the time is near. Verse 4. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is always who, who always was and who is still to come from the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ. He is faithful to witness to these things, the first, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all kings of the world. All glory to him who love us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you. I cannot thank you enough for what you have done on that cross for me. That you have purchased my freedom. You have cleansed. You have blotted all of my iniquities out, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, for what you are going to do today in this service, Father God. I ask that you remove the scales from people's eyes, Father God. I ask that you give them ears to hear, Father God, what you have for them. And I thank you, Lord, for today and what you are going to do. In your precious holy name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. I hope I didn't scare nobody because I was in Revelations. <laughs> you can be seated. Thank you. So, again, what is communion, right? I was like, Lord, lead me. According to Merriam's Webster Dictionary, it has four meanings. But I just want to talk about two of them. Number one, a Christian sacrament in which consecrated bread and wine are consumed as memorials of Christ's death or as symbols for the realization of a spiritual union between Christ and communicants or as the body and the blood of Christ. Number two, it is an intimate fellowship or rapport, communication, right? Both definitions are very true statements, but I want to talk about communion as an intimate relationship, fellowship with our Lord, right? My first example about communion is Adam and Eve. God created human beings to have fellowship with him. In Genesis 3, when God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, he desired to meet Adam and Eve and spend time in their presence. He desired that closeness with them. Even though they had just sinned, he already knew he went into the garden to be with them. Right? Another example was Moses. One of the most prominent figures in the Bible who walked closely with God through his life. In Exodus, we see that Moses was in communion with God. He went up to the mountain several times to spend time with the Lord. He was up there for 40 days and 40 nights without eating or drinking while receiving the Ten Commandments. He was in communion with God. Abraham. Abraham is known and is called by a friend of God. Because of his great faith in God. Can God look at us and call us a friend of God? Hey, there's no condemnation in Christ, but we have to examine our hearts, right? How is our relationship? How is our communion with God? You know, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about... Um, the series that Pastor Mike had uh, about coming to the table, it's an invitation, right? An invitation that uh, communion is also called the Last Supper, the, uh, the Lord's Table, um, all of these other things he, they're called. Because he invites us to the table, 
to have communion. I don't know about you, but in my family, we tend to gather at the table and we talk, intimate talk. And that's what he desires, oneness, closeness in him. So lastly, David. David was known as a man after God's own heart. He had a deep, he had a deep and intimate relationship with God. Despite facing many trials and challenges, David constantly sought God's guidance and relied on him for strength and protection. The Psalms, many of which were written by David, are the testament to his devotion to God. Can God say, Norma, you're a woman after my own heart. Can he say that about you? Are you going to him and seeking him day in and day out, reading his word day in and day out? And that's where it all comes together, the spiritual discipline of prayer, of fasting. It all, that's what he wants. He wants the closeness and the oneness with each other. Because even though David, he sinned, his son wanted to kill him. He had to go into the wilderness and he sought after God. Even though he knew he sinned, he had slept with Bathsheba's husband. I mean, wife. I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. You know? And so he sinned, but he still sought after God. How many of us are sinners? We fall short of the glory of God every single day. Hands across the Mine included, just because I'm up here, does not mean I. So I want to be honest with you. Can God say that you are a person after his own heart? There's no condemnation. I just want you to, eva- I, I want to preach the word and have repentance. Preach repentance, Father God. If I am far from you, bring me back to you. Praise God. Now let's talk about the blood. Oh, the blood. You know, the blood is the most important, is so important to God that it was mentioned in the Bible 700 times. David referred to the incorruptible blood. Peter spoke of the precious blood. And John wrote of the overcoming power of the blood. The blood is so important and So when I was thinking about the blood, I had to go back. I had to go back to Exodus, to the first Passover. When it all began, when Moses was trying to take the Israelites out of Egypt. And he was was going to the Pharaoh and he was trying to reason with him. God sent over the plagues. We all know the plagues. If you don't know it, please read Exodus. It was the 10th plague, and it was the death of the firstborn, and it's in Exodus 12, 21. And it reads, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel together, and he said to them, Go pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of your family and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin. Then take a bundle of hyssop branch and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top and the sides of the doorframe of your house. And no one may go out through that door until morning. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and on the sides of the doorframe, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your home and strike you down. Praise God. Can you imagine if they were not obedient and did that? So we move forward to the Last Supper. You know, they said from the Last Supper, I mean, I'm sorry, from the the Passover to the Lord's table, which is, the communion where they were celebrating the Passover was 500 years. 500 years. They had to celebrate that Passover uh, of unloving bread every year. It was from generation to generation. It says in Matthew 26, the Lord, 
Matthew 26, 17, the Lord and his disciples were making preparation for the Passover meal. And it says, and he took and he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And I was thinking about this and I said, Lord, in Exodus, you had said, Go pick out a lamb or a young goat. That's right. A lamb. If you move to the New Testament, see, God wastes nothing. He had already made provisions for the new lamb. So Jesus is the lamb of the new Passover because his blood was shed on the cross to save us from sins. That is why in 1 Peter 19, 20, it says, it was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as a ransom long before the world even began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. In John 1, it says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he had already made provision that it wasn't a coincidence. And I was telling Minister Beck, it wasn't a coincidence that it was a lamb in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it was still a lamb. Praise God. I thought, man, Lord, you are so good. Thank you. That even before, 500 years before that you had made that provision. Right. Praise God. Next is the, Jesus as the bread of life. Thank you. You know, and I was reading the bread of life in John 6, 22, he was talking to his disciples, and they were going back and forth. And, you know, the disciples really didn't understand Jesus. They, he talked in parables. He talked in, in riddles. And they didn't really understand what he was saying. And I can't even imagine. I thank God for the Bible. Because now I'm like, thank you, Lord, for your understanding, for your word, because I understand it. It says, um, the scripture says, Moses gave him bread. The scripture says, Moses gave him bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses. Moses did not give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives you life to the world. Sir, they said, give us this bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. However, those the father had given me will come to me and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my father's will that all who sees his son will believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up in the last day. Then the people began to murmur and disagree. Again, they didn't understand him. Then they began to say, or said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't Jesus the son of Joseph? Like, who are you? We know who his father and his mother, like, how could he be the bread of life? How can, I, how can he say, I came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, replied, stop complaining about what I said, for no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And in the last days, I will raise them up as it is written in scripture, as it is written in scripture, they will be... They will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Right? Moving on. It says, not, not that anyone has ever seen the Father. Only I, who was sent from God, has seen him. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Again, he says, yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate man in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, 
will never die. Praise God. I'm living. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live will live forever and this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other again. Right? With each other. People began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us flesh to eat? They asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink this blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Praise God. And I will raise, it says, I'm sorry, I lost my space. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise that person up as a last say, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living father who sent me in the same way. Anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as their ancestors did, but will live forever. Praise God. Praise God. You know, he is the bread of life. If we think about it, he is saying that ultimately the only place we will find true hope, true joy, true satisfaction in life is from him. He is the bread of life. The one who satisfies our spiritual hunger. And the only way we'll get that is through him and his word. His word. You have to get into his word to understand that he is the only one that could fill us. Amen. You know, sometimes you struggle with things and you don't know why. Pick up your word. Pick up your word. In the front, you have a table of contents, anything you're struggling with, anger, resentment. I don't know. There's scripture in there. Look it up. Yes. Yep. He is the only one that's going to heal you from that. Not your husband, not your children, not your career, not your job, only Jesus. He is the only one that can fill your cup. I know Apostle Marvelous was here and he said, I can't love my wife the way she wants to be loved. Or I can't love my husband the way he desires to be loved. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Go to him. Because I'm going to fail you. Man is going to fail you. So go to him. I encourage you. So I want to talk about, next I want to talk about the misconceptions about communion. I think um, I grew up in a, an old Pentecostal church, right? And, and you know, there's kind of like bad formations and we kind of grew up with them. And there's no, nothing wrong with it, but we tend to make communion a ritual and we tend to put red tape or legalities in it right like oh you can only do this or only when and i'm here to tell you just take the bread and the juice let me give you an example only unleavened bread is required for communion and if you don't have unleavened bread then you can't take communion. That's what some people think. And I'm here to tell you that's wrong. I know that I've been in hospital settings where somebody wants to take communion and I don't have the actual elements that we have here at church, right? And so we have to make do with what we have. And I asked the nurse, like, I am, if you want communion, I'm going to go and find you some communion, whether it's a cheese it or whether it's a saltine cracker, we are going to sanctify that cracker and say, God, this is your body. This is your body broken. We have to sanctify it. Scripture does not tell us if we should use levy or unlevy bread for communion. This is important to note because this type of bread we use is not the focus of communion. Yeah. 
Jesus broke the bread at the Last Supper and gave it to his disciples, right? In Luke 29, 19, we also see it in Matthew and in Mark. The bread symbolizes Jesus' blood given for our sake. On its own, it's merely a piece of bread. Whether we use unleavened or levied bread, our focus should be on Christ. The Israelites used unleavened bread during the Passover to significant signify, sorry, their quick escape from Egypt. Many churches have adopted this type of bread as part of their observation of the Lord's Supper, but not only do they believe that this is biblical grounds based on the type of bread Jesus gave the disciples, but it also because of the New Testament compares levy or yeast to sin. So if you just have a piece of cracker, sanctify it and say, God, this is your body. Don't get caught up in that. Because if we get caught up in that, then we won't take communion. We'll miss out on the opportunity to give God's bread to somebody in the hospital setting or, you know, out in, you know, on the streets when you're preaching the word. We have to make do with what we have. God's going to honor it. Another example is, Wine is the only acceptable option for the drink element. Wine. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I was at a a celebration of life for a client that I had, and um, I took communion at that church, right? Anytime you go to a different church and they ask you if you want to take part of the communion, take part of it. That's God. You are remembering God. That is God. So don't feel like, oh, I could only take it at my church and only at my church. No. Take it at any church that you go to. Anyway, back to the story. I go and I take the communion and I'm there. And, and they gave me a, the juice. And I thought, oh, it's juice. It was wine. I went, I I, I don't drink wine. I don't know. And so I was like, whoa. So be careful. You know, if you are struggling with alcoholism and they give wine, ask. Don't be afraid. Ask if they're serving juice or wine. You know, in some churches, people can hold just a rigid rules about consuming grape juice, not wine as an element of communion. A bias is either direct or direction is wrong. One should not feel guilty for drinking wine as part of the Lord's Supper, just as another person should not feel ashamed for having grape juice, right? When we hyper-focus on the elements, the bread and the wine, we miss the true meaning of the ordinance of communion. The drink symbolizes Christ's blood poured out for us. Whether we drink wine or fruit juice, we should reflect on the significance of the sacrifice Jesus made to redeem us. That's it. Don't hyper-focus on it. Lastly, you should only take communion on the fourth Sunday of every month. Right? Like, people really adopt these religious rituals things like I I was like whoa my gosh it says you should partake of the holy communion and receive the full benefits of the finished work of Christ as often as you want I I I looked up often often means frequent or many times so if you want to do it daily do it daily if you want to do it weekly do it weekly in my house when (laughs) chaos happens in my house and everybody anybody who has children knows that it gets a little hectic right school starting they're going off to school they're picking up things we have to do communion. we have to plead the blood of jesus over them and we have to take communion because those spirits want to come into your home and break up your home cause division cause arguments cause all kinds of things so whenever those things happen in my home I'm quick to say, let's do communion. There's something off here. We have to take communion. We have to sanctify our home, bring our home back to one. Because the enemy is ready to divide it. He's here to steal, kill, and destroy. And he will do anything to do that. 
So there's plenty, plenty more misconceptions about communion. We make things complicated. We're complex. I think Pastor Mike said we're complicated. We're complex people with complicated issues. We make everything complicated when it shouldn't be that complicated. <clears throat> but what we do know is that we shouldn't treat communion like it's a common meal or that it's not a big deal. Communion is not a time to get something to eat. What did Paul say? If you're hungry, eat at home. Right? Eat at home. It's not time for that. It is a time for unity in the body of Christ. Communion is a sacred tradition and a memorial that should be treated with reverence and respect. We remember that Jesus did what he did to save us by partaking in the communion. He laid down his life, taking the punishment we deserve to receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life. That's in John 10, 11. The sacrifice is not something to treat lightly. For truly, what we believe about Jesus, his death and resurrection is a matter of life and death. Life and death. And we all know that we have to make sure that our heart is right. In 1 Corinthians, it says, 1 Corinthians 11:27 It says that's why we should examine yourself. I'm sorry, that's 28. That's why we should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some even died died but if we would examine ourselves we would not be judged by God in this way so I encourage you every time you take it you make sure your heart is right any unforgiveness any bitterness anything any hurt make sure your heart is right with God before you take it because it says that's why we are sick and weak and some die. That should be taken very seriously. I was like, oh, Lord, forgive me if I ever, you know, makes me reflect on myself. So next I want to talk about the power and the blood. Ooh, I got excited about this one. I was like, Minister James, we got to sing about the blood. I believe that some Christians have forgotten or don't understand the power that is in the blood of Jesus. If an Israelite had left the blood in the basin, instead of applying it, the death angel would have struck their home. Killing the lamb would have done them no good. The shedding of the blood was not enough. The blood only had saved, the blood only had saved them when it was taken out of the basin and applied. A blood applied. I was like, okay, Lord. I, I want you to know how to apply or what it means to apply the blood of Jesus. Because this is, this is our promise that we get through the blood. It provides forgiveness of our sins. Hebrews 9.22. It gives you life. In John, John 6.53. It brings you close to God. Ephesians 2.13. It gives you boldness to approach God. Look, I am here because of God. Boldness in me. I didn't have this boldness. I didn't wake up with this boldness. It was only given through me, through God, and through the blood. It cleanses your conscience. Hebrews 9.14. It sanctifies you. Hebrews 13.12. It cleanses you. 1 John 1, 7, and it heals you. 1 Peter 2, 24, it enables you to overcome the devil and his works. Amen. I just said, the enemy is here to steal, kill, and destroy you, your family, 
your home, your finances, your health, whatever he can do. But it enables us through the blood, the power enables you to overcome the devil and his work in Revelations 12, 11. We have to learn to apply the blood of Jesus over our lives, over our children. Every time they leave the home, you plead the blood of Jesus over them over your husband, over your finances, and over your marriage. If we don't, we are powerless. We are powerless. I want to share a small testimony with you. I promise I wasn't going to talk about my kids, but I have to, of course. It's, and he doesn't know I'm going to talk about him. My son, Ethan, he was our first son. And we were so excited, right? We were like, he was hitting all the milestones in life. We we're like, yay, he's making good progress. His 18th month checkup, my son stopped talking. He stopped talking. We didn't know why he stopped talking. The doctors could only tell me it's because I had a second son. My sons are 17 months apart. That's not for the week. <laughs> not for the week. So, that was a tough time for us, for me and Gilbert. We were struggling. We were like, what happened? What did we do? We were trying to pinpoint what happened. What can it, we have done? We went to neurologists. We went to developmental doctors. Nobody could say what happened. But they only recommend that we start speech therapy. And then we had to start occupational therapy for him because he was losing like muscle mass in his hands and his torso. I mean, it was just everything you thought possible was going wrong. We were like, it was going wrong. But we, we continued, we hung on, we said, okay, Lord, we're gonna do speech therapy. We got him into early education school um, so that he could be with you know peers his own age and kind of learn and things like that. And so we did speech therapy for quite some time. Three days, I think it was three days a week we had to go to speech therapy. Slowly but surely, and I was pleading the blood of Jesus over my son. I was like, Father, whatever is holding his tongue, I release it in the name of Jesus. Because there's nothing that can come against the blood. Nothing. I'm here to tell you, he's happy, he's healthy. He is everything that God called him to be. Praise God. I'm telling you, when you plead the blood of Jesus over your children, you are going to see miracles happen. And right now, you might not see it. Right now, you might be in the trenches. You might have a prodigal son or daughter that is not here with you. But continue to pray. Continue to plead the blood of Jesus over them. They're going to come. God's word says that. Nothing can come against the blood of Jesus. Amen. Praise God for his word. I thank him every single day for my son. And you know, they said that my son would not have empathy. That he was not going to make friends. He wasn't going to know how to. And I'm terrified to tell you that he's an anthem. And the anthem, love him. And I see him high-fiving all his friends in here. And I'm like, devil, you are a liar. He could make friends. Thank you, Trenton, for your mentoring of my son. God's going to do great things through you. So praise God. Praise God. I thank you that your word doesn't come back void. I thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Sorry, I, I'm getting emotional because I think of what they said that he was going to be, and he's not. Why? That's why. So these are tears of joy because right. all that he brought us through. So praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I thank you, Lord. So I think that there is power in the blood. I know um, I had talked to Minister Becca, and I had told her um, that I was uh, on the internet, and I was looking at this, this video about this teacher. She was a witch. 
She was a witch and she was casting spells on her students, but she knew which students she couldn't touch because she saw in the spiritual realm blood over this child. So you don't know who is trying to hurt your children, your husband, your family members. Because there is a spiritual world. And let me tell you, she said I could not access that child. And I said, praise God. So I'm here to tell you, plead the blood of Jesus over your children. Plead the blood of Jesus over the food that you get at the grocery store. Because you don't know what hands it's been in and what people are doing to that food. So I'm here to tell you there's power in the blood of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. I thank you, Lord, for your blood and everything you've done. For what you have done on that cross for us. I'm a mother. And I don't know. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I cannot send my son, my firstborn son, to that cross. I couldn't. Not for the sins of everybody on this world. I couldn't. So I thank God that he sent his son on the cross to die for me so that I could be here. Thank God. Praise God. So right now we're going to get into communion. I want to seal this sermon with communion. We need to know and make sure that whatever we're going through, that we seal it with the blood of Jesus. So as we get our elements ready, we're going to have them there at the top of the of the of the stage so I would like y'all to grab y'all's elements and I want y'all to examine y'all's hearts examine y'all's hearts and what y'all are going through in y'all's life and what y'all need to plead the blood of Jesus over I think it's important that we know That in the blood is deliverance. In the blood, there's restoration. In the blood, there's healing. In the blood, there's prosperity, protection, peace, and life. So if you're struggling today, if everyone can stand, we can grab our elements and come up. make y'all's way up to the middle. God, thank you, Lord, for your blood and your bread, the body that was broken for us. That you made us white as snow, Father God, remembering nothing and what we've done. We don't deserve it. If we really want to be honest, we don't deserve it. But he did it for us. Everyone got their elements? All right. And I want you to hold your elements. I want you just to declare this blood over your life in your own way. Plead the blood of Jesus over yourself that no weapon formed against you 
will prosper in the mighty name of Jesus. It won't prosper against your children, your finances, your homes, your jobs, your careers, everything, every area of your life. You know what you're struggling with. You know. And if you have dealing with something that you've been healed from, but it keeps coming back. And you don't know why it's coming back, but it's probably maybe in your generational bloodline, maybe addictions, maybe depression, maybe cancer is in your bloodline. What you say today, you say, Father God, I for, forgive me of my sins, but forgive my ancestors for their sins. For the known and the unknown, Father God, and I ask that you wash my bloodline with your blood. Wash it clean, Father God. The enemy thinks he has us, but he doesn't. We're here to declare today that we are saved by his blood. So I encourage you in your own way, seek out God. Say, God, I need you. I need your strength. I don't know what my future looks like, Father God, but I plead the blood of Jesus over my future. Father God, if we came in here feeling guilty about what we could have, should have done, I'm here to tell you that you did exactly what you're supposed to do. Whatever chains that you came in here, they're broken through this blood. Amen. There is life in this blood. In Leviticus 17, 14, it says the life of every creature is in the blood. You have life. That is your promise through the blood. So if anything tries to come against your life, you say right now, I am covered with the blood of Jesus. There is life in the blood. I have life and life more abundantly. You can't take it, devil. Declare that. Praise God. So we go to 1 Corinthians. It says, for I pass on this, on this to you. What I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread. He broke it. And gave thanks for God for it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take your bread. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood do this to remember me it says every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes today until he comes again I thank you, Father, for your bread. I thank you, Father God, for your bread, Father God, that was broken for me, Father. I thank you for your people, Lord Jesus, who do this and do it as often as you want. Do it daily if you need to do it daily. Do it weekly if you need to do it weekly. However you feel fit in your home, you do it. But make sure you apply the blood of Jesus to every area of your life, Father. Right now, in your own way, seek him, pray. Ask him for forgiveness for whatever it is. Nobody can pray for you the way you want to be prayed for. Pray for yourself. 
declare over yourself that you are healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Over your mind, your heart, and your body, Father God. I thank you, Lord, for the blood. I can't thank you enough for the blood that was shed for me. For the marriages, Father, that are coming together, Lord Jesus, or even that they're falling apart, Father God, right now I declare the blood of Jesus over their marriages. Over children's minds, Father God, right now that the enemy wants to take their minds and, and have blow confusion in their mind of who they are and what they are. I declare that confusion has to leave in the mighty name of Jesus. It can't touch our children. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. If you need extra prayer, our altar team is here to pray with you. Don't run off. Don't leave so quickly. If you need extra time here at the altar to surrender, please do so. Please do so. I thank every one of you. I'm going to pray. And if we have any first-time guests, please let us meet you in the back. We want to meet you. We want to tell you more about RGM and how we reach, grow, and move. Yeah. So I thank you, everyone, for coming today, for hearing the word, for declaring the blood over your homes. I thank you. There is power in the blood. Don't forget there is power in the blood. If you don't know how to pray or if you don't know what to say, you just say, Father God, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. That's it. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you for all of your people and what you are going to do through them, in them and through them, Father God. I thank you right now that you are making provisions for every single one of them, Father God. That you are opening doors for, for them and for their children, Father God. I thank you for your blood that has healed their bloodline right now, Father God. That they no longer are going to be suffering with depression and anxiety, Father God, because of your blood. I thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your grace, Father, that you give us every single day. I ask you to bless your people as they exit this building, Father God, that you are never going to leave them. That you bless them they're going to and from, Father God. Bless them at their work, at their schools, Father God. I thank you, Father God, again for what you're doing and for your blood, Father and I seal it with your blood. Right. Seal it with your blood. Nothing can come near us, Father God. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Right. And we declare it in your precious holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen.